it's just really fun to be able to sit and quarter away from everyone if we are wanted to get some content. For our whole team, it's I think one of the most exciting events to watch because we've got you, Alex, and Will in there and all racing the Italian. Trying to catch the Italian. Stefano Raimondi is his name. Put it on the dock. Yeah. Let's touch a little bit on your main rivals. So I've heard about the Italian his <laughs> name. But now there's a new kid on the block too. They're, they're good. I, I get along with them, which is really annoying that I do. Stefano is from Italy. He's currently number one in just everything. And Igor is from Ukraine. Swimming can be a very stalky sport. I tend to not actually look at any of the psych sheets or the times from the other athletes, but you do know their times. So for example, Stefano went like 54.6 for like the 100 meters butterfly. That's like two seconds faster than me. He's way ahead. The 100 fly will be a difficult race. So there's about a second between me and the Ukrainian and then two seconds between me and the Italian. But the interesting one's actually the 200 IM. There's only about a second and a half between Stefano and I. So over the course of 200 meters, a second and a half isn't that much. It can be really hard to compare athletes in para sport when disabilities are very different and especially in the same category because I'm the only amputee that races in S10. That entire race, I'm disadvantaged because of there's no foot, so less to kick, weaker core, less on the turns, less off the starts. He's actually got a kid on the way. Hopefully that can rattle his sleep for training and stuff. My main event will always be the 100 fly. I will always be a 100 metres butterfly. But in terms of that gold medal or being closer to Stefano, I'm a lot closer in that I am than I am the butterfly. The work that Cole and I do very closely and one-on-one -on -one would be centred around his I am and even more specifically his breaststroke component. From a biomechanics point of view, I also, you know, throw the rule book out a little bit or because it is unique. He is missing, you know, the foot, so we have to look at different aspects of how we can gain propulsion through the water, which has been a fun challenge. When you get to this level, crunch time, anyone can do a performance that will generate a gold medal at any time. It's just all about execution. Cole does all the right things to get him into a spot where he can produce that performance. It's just if he can get his nerves under control when he races. He gets a little nervy, he gets a little jumpy. You don't want to go anywhere near him before, you know, 10 minutes before his race. And sometimes, you know, that's a detriment to preparation. You're so nervous, you can't perform, you can't execute your race. Outside of swimming, I don't think I've ever experienced a, a panic attack, let's say, but at Tokyo, and I'll never forget the feeling of this. I remember sitting in my seat like I am now, and I'm just shaking, like doing the little leg shake, kind of listening to some Eminem, and just thinking about <laughs> what's gonna go wrong. Like, what happens if I get fourth? What happens if I false start? It's about five minutes before the race now. I could sort of feel my legs get a bit tingly and I started standing up and moving my body around to get some blood flow, just feel relaxed, just try and calm myself down. We all had to wear a mask, so I pulled that off and was starting to like get short breaths. I was panting like a dog. Then as we're lining up to lane one, et cetera, lane two, et cetera, lane six, Cole Pierce, I could feel my hands get numb. And I'm like, oh, this is probably just some like excitement, nerves, pour some water on it, maybe that'll get some feeling back. And it just kept spreading. My whole body went into, it was just numb. I had pins and needles throughout my whole body and 
when I walked out on pool deck, I had like head spins. It was weird. There was no one in the crowd, but that was the first time I'd ever swam at a venue that had the capacity of 30,000. So the pool's tiny and the grandstands are freaking huge. It was like the MCG. Walking behind the blocks, I couldn't feel anything. If you were to punch me in the gut, probably wouldn't have felt it because it was just my whole body went into panic mode. And diving in, my immediate thought process was like, like shit, I'm actually swimming at the Paralympic Games in a final. Like, what, what's actually going on? Then about 35 meters into the race, I kind of realized, I'm like, shit, I've actually got to follow a race plan here. Tokyo was the first one. And then I thought, Tokyo's gonna be the worst thing that ever happens in terms of nerves, but we moved towards world champs, com games and trials. It now, it's now a reoccurring thing where right before my race, I get shaky, I get pins and needles throughout my body, but I also lose, start to lose my breath. I think the best way to describe it is almost like a panic attack. If I'm not throwing up, nearly in tears, head spin, body numb, probably not gonna swim well, which is you, funny. You say almost like a panic attack. Is that not just a panic attack? Yeah, are you, are you it is. Yeah. He was coming to me thinking it was about swimming, but the more we talked, um, I think it was more about everything that he's gone through. I knew that if we worked together consistently enough that this wasn't gonna take as long as what he might have thought at the time. Um, so it was actually managing a lot of the stress outside the sport because, and just let him swim, he can swim, right? So he's got the talent. So it was really looking big picture first, yeah. And I think people see kind of well-being, the person, separate from high performance, but actually we know the evidence base is that, that for a person to be well and mentally fit, um, their performance is, is much better. I don't know if I used the analogy with you of a tennis match. Your negative voice sits on this shoulder and your healthy voice is here. Imagine it's a tennis match and this one serves over the net and you don't serve back. I love that. That is like being <laughs> aced exactly. and you hate being, you're so competitive, you would never let it be aced, right? You would hit back, yes? And if you get you, when your healthy voice is on, when you're really confident, you are really powerful. So any of those kind of things, it's really just going to your happy place and making sure you're breathing. It's the actual breath that physiologically brings your cortisol and adrenaline down, mm -hmm. but emotions can actually do that. Some like to tune into their body and notice the discomfort and adjust, and others tune out, right? And I feel like with you, you've got, if we could get you in the pocket of knowing what it is, but not, not noticing it that much, and just focusing more on the swim, I feel like they're the vulnerabilities we've got. When you go in and notice discomfort, or when you go out and notice everybody else are they in front of you. They're the two things, and if we, can, if we can have strategies for those two, when you get in the pool and you actually swim and you focus on the swim, yeah. it's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, it's been a great lead up training wise, racing wise, no. I think one, at, they sort of balance each other. The harder we train, the, the slower I'm gonna be swimming, but like moving forward six months in time, it's gonna even out. In January in Adelaide, start of the year, start of 2024, it's the year of the games. <laughs> I swam like PB plus 12 my IM, PB plus five my 100 fly. That, that was really bad. I was doing those times at like 13, 14. Pretty much every month of this year leading up to June, we've had a competition and I've swam pretty poorly. I swam under the qualifying time, I think like once, but as I said, you have to swim that qualifying time at trials. And I've done it once out of the like 30 races I've done this year. So pretty much once a month, Every time I finish the race, I'm like, shit, I'm not gonna make the team. Like, shit, that was a poor time. I'm not gonna be under that qualifying time. Shit, what happens now if I keep swimming like I do in June?
Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> For February, I probably shouldn't be this nervous, but I don't know. I was, like last night, I didn't sleep that well just because I was. I think I think just because there's other international athletes here, people from Queensland, it's kind of a big deal. We've been doing ten swims for the past month, so we've been like putting in work, and now we've sort of backed off a bit, tapering uh, for this competition. So it's also like starting to kick in a little bit now. But I don't know. The fact I can't even finish breakfast shows how nervous I'm getting because that's one thing I'm trying to work on. But that's the half the reason I work with Sam is to put these nerves into practice for Paris because. I am going to be the, probably 10 times more nervous at Paris, so at least I fucking use these nerves and still do the race processes correctly and still teach myself how to do it, push myself to eat more so I'm feeling my body. Because it's you know a Paralympic year, it'd be really good if I could go on a QT in February under the training block we've just done in the past month, plus having my finger out of action for a bit. Um, yeah, so I think it's just expectation on me, but like Sam would say, if I don't swim well this weekend, what's the worst possible outcome. So I'll have that in the back of my mind if it all goes down the hill. See, I couldn't eat breakfast. <laughs> Like the first 50, the process was awful. I was trying to go slow then fast into the wall. Yeah. I went at 57 rate to then at 52 on the wall. So I went hard then slow. When I shifted, slow then hard. But yeah. 9 8, I'm like, it's already faster than Adelaide, but yeah, it's still pretty yeah. fast 3. Yeah. But it's a heat, so we're, we're chilling. Yeah. Take off in that 50 free. I was like, oh, yeah. fuck. The, the fly was spot on. 7-7, uh, seven, seven, 55 tempo early, but then settled at 54. That would I mean, back was great as well. You were 34-7, uh, but it was like a long 34, and you didn't lose a lot of acceleration over the wall. Turned in 2-3. The, the breast, the tempo was better. Uh, we just got to find that way to hold tempo and hold at the same yeah, time. I can feel like the 25 my hips drop, and that's where that sitting high at the surface starts to collapse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously fatigue's quite high, but I was just like, fuck, yeah. trying to force my way through the water under that fatigue, which is shit, but. Yeah, and first I technically looked good, it just didn't have the pop. Take 26. <laughs> so I'm here on the Gold Coast competing at the Australian Open Nationals. Paralympic trials are about eight, nine weeks away now. Um, so starting to get a little bit nervous, but it's getting close. Like, I, this year's gone so freaking quickly. Like, the whole year has just been swim, swim, swim. A little bit of more swim and just extra swim. Joel mentioned it on our training camp that we made the mistake last year um, of backing off too much in April uh, and not, you know, leaving enough in the tank for June last year. The focus is to sort of maintain that that fitness and that tempo to, you know, maintain consistency in that 2am and hopefully 100 fly, but 
yeah, look, it's it's tough. I'm not enjoying it, but it's all part of the process, I guess. And uh, hopefully getting into trials, this taper will save me. I actually had a dream about trials last night, which is weird. I don't know why. We're in Brisbane in the hotel. I don't even know what the hotel looks like, but I don't know. Once we get this taper, taper shave, I'll probably feel a bit better, but... I'm just really nervous. I don't really know how to like even ask this question, but trying to back it up after having one really poor swim. This is just hypothetical. If I'm not swimming all day two, I gotta back that up day three. So look, if day one doesn't go to plan, I can't see any way that it wouldn't. I, I assume you're going in the car with mum and your sister? Probably, yeah, yeah. we'll just catch an Uber. Okay, get in the car after the race uh, at night and just cut one as loud as you possibly can. <laughs> Because then no one's going to talk to you about swimming. My standpoint, because like when I go to bed that night, yeah, like I've worked. You can only you know discuss so much with Sam and so much with Mum and Ashley, and then there yeah. comes a point where then it's your part, because you know. Yeah, you just got to bring it back to what's real. We're talking about a circumstance that I don't think is going to occur. But if it was that the hundred fly didn't go to plan for whatever reason, you know, maybe maybe it's something that's uncontrollable that happened but then you come back to to what is actually real and you know we've rehearsed on on Tuesday afternoons 22 times reality 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 and the reality is that you could really have a really shocking day on day three and still qualify for the Paralympics I mean you could have a you could have a what most people would regard as a terrible day at the races and you'll still make the team <laughs> and that's that's what's real you know so my my two chances for making the Paris Paralympics are the 100 meters butterfly and the 200 IM and so it's all about time how swimming competitions work is you've got heats and finals. Heats are in the morning, finals are at night. The top eight fastest in the morning in the heats will progress to the final at night where, no, oh, that's it. The reason we have trials for Paralympics is so that we select our best athletes to perform at the biggest stage because you don't want to send a team that's not going to win. Australia are a really competitive and dominant swimming country, so we set our standards really high How they base the qualifying times for Paris are from the World Championships previously. So in 2023, the top three fastest plus 1.2%. The the 200 IM is 216.58, and the 100 fly is 57.44. Those two numbers have got to be under on race day. If not, I'm done for. So it's a bit different for Olympic and Paralympics. So the Olympic guys have to swim it at night, but for the Paralympians, we have the opportunity to swim the qualifying time in the heat and the final. There's 14 different disabilities slash classifications in the water. Essentially, none of those swimmers are racing each other for a spot. They're racing their own world record. So there's a point system and a thousand means you've broken a world record. When I finish a race and I score 850, it would mean I'm roughly two, three seconds off the world record. Compared to someone who maybe have no arms or no legs, swim a minute slower than me, but they could be only half a second off the world record and point score higher than me. My PB for the 200 IM is currently 213.68. So I'm pretty much three seconds under the qualifying times in the 200 IM. And then in the 100 fly, my PB is 56.76 and 57.44 is the qualifying time. So about 0.7 of a second difference between my PB and the qualifying time. The brutal part about swimming is nothing's guaranteed in the sport. Part of growing up and maturing as a professional athlete is knowing that you're never going to be 100% every day. As you get older, it gets harder to get better. But even more brutal, like there's two things you have to worry about. You've got that time, which is the number one thing, but you can be under that time, but have people in front of you. There's some really young talent coming through in Australia. Definitely hot on my tail on the 100 fly. 
that 100 fly is where I've had the most success as a swimmer and there's some boys really hunting me down in it. It's race day, mom. I fucking not. <laughs> oh, I hate it. 